So I'm going to really focus my talks today on food insecurity because that is my topic of interest. And I'm going to start by, um, I don't have any commercial conflicts of interest. Um, I'm going to start with outlining for you the three questions that um, I'm hoping we will get a chance to start answering today. The first is, does food insecurity impact health? The second is, if it does, what are the economic implications? And third, how should we be responding? So starting with this food insecurity impact health, I'm going to start with talking about the way in which I understand those, the ways in which food insecurity impacts health. And this is the conceptual model that I work from. Um, and that is that when you live, live in a food insecure household, you engage a number of different coping strategies to avoid that physical sensation of hunger. And it is not the hunger in and of itself that is damaging for your health. It is these coping strategies, which are adaptive in the short term because they that gets you adequate calories generally so that you're not losing weight, but are maladaptive when they're sustained over a long period of time. And we've learned a lot about those coping strategies today, but I, I group them roughly in uh, decreases in dietary quality, a change in eating behaviors or the way we eat, and decreased bandwidth, or, or having, such a, having a focus on where your next meal is gonna come from that crowds out your ability to take care of other important things that are, that are important for your long-term success. And the, the panel on uh, food insecurity in college is a great example of how focus on the need to eat may decrease academic performance. So we know that these have an impact on physical and mental health. Once you have physical and mental health challenges in the US, we know that that is very expensive, that your healthcare expenditures go up, your ability to maintain steady employment goes down. Uh, once you're in that situation, your household income declines and you're forced to make a bunch of spending trade-offs and then you're right back in a food insecure household. And the really important point about, the, about conceptualizing this as a cycle is that it is both true that food insecurity causes poor health and that in the United States in particular, poor health causes food insecurity. So one of the things that we haven't discussed much today is that the typical experience of food insecurity in the United States is cyclic and episodic. And uh, this variation is seen monthly when you receive a monthly paycheck and those, um, that money doesn't last till the end of the month. It happens seasonally in cold climates when heating bills are high in the wintertime, food insecurity rates spike, or in the summertime um, in households with children, food insecurity rates spike when the children lose access to school-based lunches and sometimes breakfast as well. Um, and then there's random variation that in many, many households has to do with uh, a medical crisis or even not so much of a medical crisis, but a small medical event like the need for an antibiotic that costs you know, 200 bucks or something. In the US, though, the average household that's food insecure will experience seven episodes of food inadequacy. So these snaps of food inadequacy tend to be discrete periods, relatively short, but repetitive. They happen over and over and over throughout the year. And we know that during those periods of food inadequacy, dietary intake declines. And we've seen, we have documented that most um, precisely among mothers. So one of the things that this pattern enables us to do is to start studying how your compensatory strategies or your coping strategies might differ during times of food inadequacy as opposed to during times of food adequacy. And as you can imagine, during food adequacy, you might, if you lived in a food insecure household, you might avoid food waste, you might systematically overconsume food in anticipation of a spell of food inadequacy or food shortage in the future, and you might shift your, energy, your dietary intake towards more energy dense foods. In fact, these are very common coping strategies that we see in food insecure households. But then during episodes of food shortage, you can imagine that, that the coping strategies that predominate would be Th those along the lines of skipping meals or reducing caloric intake. Now, from a health perspective, we can take advantage of this variation in coping strategies in a specific 
model, and that is in the cases of diabetes. And so we're going to use diabetes as a model for a few minutes because, you, as you can imagine, during episodes of food adequacy, those coping behaviors might predispose you to a high blood sugar. Well, during episodes of food shortage, the coping behaviors might predispose you to low blood sugar. Now, remember uh, a second ago, oh, that's so ugly, huh? Well, okay. So remember a second ago I told you that uh, food insecurity was cyclic and episodic, and in many households, the time of the month that's most challenging is the last few days of the month. So we decided to take advantage of this variation to say, well, if skipped meals and reduced caloric intake are more prevalent at the end of the month, then we would expect low blood sugar to be more prevalent at the end of the month. And so what we did in a very crude study was we looked at all hospital admissions to every hospital in the state of California, and we pulled out those ones that were from low, for low blood sugar. And what you see in that middle line that you probably can't see unless you have very good eyes, it's like a chartreuse line, is that the day of the month in which people were admitted overall to hospitals in California for low blood sugar was about the same every day of the month. But if you pulled out the people who are living in the lowest income households, and that's the top line, first of all, every, and every day of the month, admissions for low blood sugar were higher. That's probably the impact of poverty. But in particular, in the last week of the month, admissions for low blood sugar went up by 27% compared to the first week of the month. And I would posit to you that that increase of 27% is likely due to food insecurity, but I'm going to give you some evidence to prove that over the next couple of minutes. Okay, so I, I just gave you one example, and now I'm going to skirt over hundreds of articles and tell you that food insecurity impacts health. We know it in the case of diabetes. It causes both high blood sugar and low blood sugar and excess admissions. We also know that it impacts obesity rates among women, congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, and a host of other conditions. But I'm going to skip over that uh, so that I have the chance to talk to you a little bit about what the economic implications of that health impact are. So, First of all, if you're like me, you would look at that, that graph of the 27% increase at the end of the month, and you would say, well, that's ridiculous, because don't those hospital admissions cost us way more than food? And so this is a very uh, rigorously studied example in one managed care organization, what one of those hospital admissions for low blood sugar cost a managed care organization in 2011? $17,564 for every inpatient admission for low blood sugar. And we compare that to the USDA's estimate of how much it, it costs to feed a household of four on the Thrifty Food Plan, $657. Okay, so, so then we say to ourselves, if we can help people meet their food budgets, are we able to make an impact on their health? So to answer that question, first we have to say, what resources are available to help people make their food budgets? And I like to bucket these into four categories, which you may or may not be able to see uh, from the back. The first is our federal nutrition programs. The second is the large charitable feeding system. There's personal, your, obviously your personal income and shifting money around within your personal income so that you can meet your food budget. I'm, gonna pay for, I'm not going to pay for uh, my gas this month because I have to pay for food. And then there is informal social support, which is a huge um, coping mechanism for meeting food budgets within the household. So we're going to concentrate for a minute on the federal nutrition programs because it is by far the largest source of external support uh, for addressing food insecurity in the U.S. And we'll start by talking about SNAP, CalFresh in, in California, which we have heard a number of times before. But I will remind those of you who don't know that uh, the scope and scale of SNAP is enormous. One in seven Americans is enrolled in SNAP. It's about 46 million people at a cost of $70 billion annually. SNAP exists and SNAP benefits are redeemable in every county in the U.S. And the average benefit in California is $1.40 per person per meal. So it is money that's added to people's household food budgets. It isn't a lot of money. 
As a matter of fact, if you think for yourself, how would I be able to, sur to, to survive on a food budget of $1.40 per meal, you probably will start understanding how challenging this is. It is very effective at reducing food insecurity. As a matter of fact, um, SNAP is associated with a 5 to 10% reduction in food insecurity. But because the most food insecure people are those that are enrolled in SNAP, and SNAP benefits are so low, we, the food insecurity rate, with, even within SNAP, is still very high, 54%. OK, so you might then ask the question, say to yourself, if that 27% increase at the end of the month was due to was due to food insecurity, then can SNAP make a difference? So this was the question that we asked. And in order to do this, we took advantage of a natural experiment. So in May of 2009, Barack Obama signed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and this provided a temporary but quite dramatic increase in SNAP benefit levels that started in May of 2009 and expired in October of 2013. So then we said to ourselves, what happened during that four-year period to that 27% increase? And to do this, we used another data set, commercially insured this time. Not everybody, just commercially insured, so not the lowest income of the low income. And only people between the age, ages of 18 and 64. And we first said, does that increase in hospital admissions for low blood sugar at the end of the month still exist? And the answer was yes. So the, so the research is sound. There really is a spike at the end of the month. And then the second question was, can we see it both during the a ARRA period and not during the AARA period? And the answer was, during the May 2009 to October 2013 period, there was no increase in end of the month low blood sugar admissions across the US. It only existed prior to, or we could only find it prior to 2009 and after October of 2013. So then we said, well, if we were able to bring hospital admissions for low blood sugar, just those extra 27% at the end of the month, back down to baseline through something like the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, what would that do? How much money could we save? And the answer was $54.1 million just for commercially insured people between the ages of 18 and 64, which honestly is a pretty low risk population for low blood sugar admissions. So the cost here is quite high. So this is some evidence that food insecurity has a profound and very rapid impact on people's health, at least for some people, those with diabetes. So now we want to look and say, OK, so what is the relationship between food insecurity and healthcare expenditures overall? And for this study, what we did was we used population-based data, asked people whether they were food secure or food insecure, just low in the low-income population, and then followed them over time to see what their healthcare expenditures were in the coming 12 to 24 months. And the difference in healthcare expenditures between people who were food insecure and food secure was $1,863. So if you're food insecure today, your healthcare expenditures are likely to be $1,863 more in the next year than if you weren't food insecure. Again, giving us really good evidence that food insecurity has a really strong impact on health. And so following that SNAP example I gave you, you may ask the question, well, are efforts to improve food security helpful to reduce that $1,863? Or can SNAP make a difference in this differential? And the answer is yes. For people who are enrolled in SNAP, even if they're food insecure, the savings on your future health care expenditures amount to $1,409 per person per year. So compare that. $1,800 differential between food secure and food insecure, 1,409 savings though if you're enrolled in SNAP. So I'm gonna take a pause for a minute to give you a little commercial break because I think it's an important but tangential point which is that the Hunger Safety Net, SNAP, the charitable feeding system, is designed to feed people. It's not designed to save healthcare costs. And we have to be really careful when we talk about this information to not communicate 
that the hunger safety net system should be in place as a mechanism to reduce health care costs. However, it's also become really clear that there are, I mean, everybody knows, that there are very strong incentives for health systems to reduce costs. And costs can act as this common currency among sectors that have been, as, as Dr. Brownell indicated in his talk, have been, uh, there's been a lot of tension in these areas lately. And in particular, in particular, in the context of the healthcare costs of, associated with food insecurity, one of the things we have to think about is addressing food insecurity in clinical settings is often met with a healthcare executive's query, that's not my job, that's the role of public health, not healthcare. And there is a tension between public health and healthcare when we're talking about these social determinants of health. But cost is a common currency that can, that can incentivize healthcare systems to start addressing issues such as food insecurity in clinical and in community-based settings. Uh, and this helps us support programs, and as I hope to show you in a, in a minute, programs can have an enormous impact. Okay, so commercial's over, we're back to the main talk. If so, what are the economic implications? I think they are enormous, but we have a lot of effective strategies for response. SNAP being one example, and I'm gonna give you another example um, in a minute. So how should we be responding? So I'm gonna take you back to these resources for food insecure households. We know, or I hope I've convinced you, that SNAP is a really effect, well, let me back up and say, I'm not gonna talk much today about informal social support and personal income, because we don't have time to do that, uh, and because my work doesn't center there, but very, very important for food insecure households. SNAP works. I think SNAP has tremendous public health benefit. SNAP also is hugely important at reducing food insecurity rates in the US. WIC also works. It is very clear that children who are enrolled in WIC have better health outcomes, better academic performance, and better long-term uh, income. I'm gonna talk for a minute about two, uh, one, um, uh, area of the charitable feeding system, that's the Feeding America network of food banks, and then spend one minute talking about EDSF, which bridges the charitable feeding system uh, and government support and government efforts to address food insecurity in local communities. So starting with Feeding America, the Feeding America network is a network of approximately 200 local, regional, and state level food banks. Uh, that source food from all different retailers, farmers, uh, producers, growers, uh, and distribute that food to uh, about 60,000 food pantries and meal programs across the United States. And through that process are able to reach about 46 million Americans annually, so enormous scope and scale. Uh, there are Feeding America food banks. Uh, the, the service areas of Feeding America food banks cover every single county in the United States. So one of the examples of ways in which we can work within the food banking system to reach a tremendous number of people with healthier food options is by doing things like remodeling our food pantries so they are places in which uh, people, are, people are nudged towards choosing healthier food items. And one of the ways Feeding America has been working to do this is by supporting food uh, banks and food pantries to inst institute behavioral economic strategies in the pantry setting. And these behavioral economic strategies, and I hope you can see some photos um, at the bottom of these of these beautiful food pantries uh, ha have available attractive organizing and full displays of fruits and vegetables, the healthy foods displayed at eye level and right when you walk in the door and in multiple places, and the unhealthy foods uh, in displayed in lower quantities in an effort to create an environment where people uh, want to take healthier foods home uh, to themselves and their families. There's also been tremendous effort in food banks across the U.S. to implement policies to, again, support the distribution of healthier foods through the network. And this is an example of a photo that I took in uh, a food bank in uh, the Midwest. It is over here a pallet of soda, and over here, you can't read this at all, um, but it says expired slash spoiled product for disposal, and there's a big X in the category sending it directly to the landfill. 
So policies make a huge difference, and when we work with these systems, we can support uh, these systems in their, in their efforts to, in, to implement policies that have a huge difference on dietary intake down the line. Uh, and this is just an, another example of really the food banking system acknowledging the important influence that they have on the dietary intake of their clients and recognizing with that important role comes an important responsibility and that we have to be, re, re, be moving healthier food through that system. And there has been tremendous growth uh, in making food pantries look, in many cases, like an idealized grocery store, particularly in California where access to fruits and vegetables uh, it, through the food banking system is really enormous. And finally, I will give you a couple of words um, about EDSF because I think these programs have a really unique capacity to work between the charitable feeding system um, and local efforts. And I think local efforts, particularly in today's political climate, are so important for the work we need to be doing to address food insecurity in our communities. So um, EDSF is a fresh fruit and vegetable voucher program, and, and we um, work in San Francisco, and the way it works is we partner with about 60 community-based organizations that, that work directly with people who are low income. These are federally qualified health centers, supportive housing units, um, adult day centers, um, health and wellness centers, a whole host of community-based organizations who identify people who really want to be eating healthier food but don't have the financial ability to do so. And those community organizations take on the responsibility of distributing our EDSF vouchers, which um, people are able to redeem for $10 worth of fruits and vegetables every week for 6 to 12 months. It's a really long program, long enough theoretically to support uh, behavior change. People take those vouchers to any one of our EDSF stores, and really importantly, EDSF stores in our three target neighborhoods in San Francisco, the neighborhoods with the highest health disparities, are essentially every store where you would want to eat fruits and vegetables. So you don't have to change your shopping behaviors. You can go to the farmer's market if you want. You can go to your corner store if you want. You can go to your big box store. You can go to your Safeway if you want. Wherever you want to do your shopping, you can take your voucher. Those vouchers are then mailed back to us at the, at the Center for Vulnerable Populations. We reimburse the vendor, and the participant just shows up in a month or two months or three months to pick up their next stack of vouchers. Okay, so this is really designed with the person, with the person in mind, a person whose biggest barrier to healthier dietary intake is, fruit and veg is, is financial affordability. There are three stool legs on the stool on which EDSF is based. And I think it's important that we acknowledge those three stools because these are such tightly interwoven problems. The first is we're we hope to support healthier dietary intake. The second is we hope to increase food security. And the third, most importantly, is that we're really trying to drive the supply of fruits and vegetables into these underserved neighborhoods, the Tenderloin, South of Market, Bayview, Hunters Point. For those of you who know San Francisco, these are very, very vulnerable communities. And communities in which it's very challenging for vendors, particularly our corner stores, to stock fruits and vegetables because there isn't money in the community to purchase them. And when there isn't money in the community to purchase fruits and vegetables, they don't get purchased, they rot on the shelves, and therefore vendors can't afford to keep them there. And so we really think we're on the right track here. We, um, we do regular surveys of our participants and they report to us that they increase their dietary intake of fruits and vegetables by about a serving a day. They're more food secure. They have greater confidence in their ability to make a healthy, to make a healthy diet on a budget because they've had the opportunity to experiment the danger of buying a head of broccoli and taking it home to your family when the family may or may not eat it, that that, that risk is mitigated a lot when we bought, we bought the broccoli and it's not coming out of your income, and improved health and quality of life. And, me, and just as importantly, the vendors, particularly the corner stores in our low-income neighborhoods, report new customers, increased revenue, and higher produce turnover, which means higher quality produce uh, for everybody in the neighborhood, not just those people who receive the vouchers. And that's really um, important for us. In fact, a number of our corner stores now um, have, to, have had to increase increase the number of times that their fruits or vegetables are distributed per week um, because they have such turnover. 
We hope to be citywide by 2020, and we have um, expansion to Los Angeles very quickly um, within our plans. Um, so how should we respond? The question really getting to how should we respond, I will turn back at you and say, how should you respond? And I'm going to give you three strategies that have been impactful in my own uh, work. First of all, you should know that the Farm Bill is enormously important for SNAP, enormously important. And it is being negotiated right now as we speak. And the message is that we should be communicating to everybody who will listen. But if you know a legislator or a policymaker, you can make a phone call or write a letter. We have to protect our benefits, and we have to oppose block grants, because block grants will result in states eliminating um, uh, benefits for many people. We also know that even though SNAP is the best answer because it's by far the largest food security program in the U.S. and it's so effective, it doesn't reach many people. And for many that they do reach, the benefit levels are too low. The last time the calculations of how much you needed in your SNAP budget were updated was 1964. So we have to also, at the same time, support local initiatives that make up that gap. So that's your local food bank. It's your local fruit and vegetable voucher program. It's organizations like the California Food Policy Advocates that do state-level advocacy. And I want to just remind people, particularly in a political climate where fewer things are going to be done at the federal level, that state and local policies are tremendously important in determining food insecurity at your local community level. And so the things that you do at the state level and locally make a huge difference. So whatever your skills and capacities are in your local community, uh, that's what you should be doing. They do have a big impact. And with that, I will stop. <laughs> questions? Do we have time for questions? What? OK, we do have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any. Hi, thank, thank you for all of that. That was wonderful. I'm just wondering, in the Eat SF program and in the expansions, what is the plan or what have you noticed in after the 6 to 12 months when the vouchers stop for the clients? Yeah, That's a great question. So what happens after 6 to 12 months? We still are accumulating that data, so I can't tell you for sure. But I can tell you, based on preliminary analysis, that some of the gains are maintained and some of them are not. And I think that it really depends upon how food insecure you are when you go into the program. If you're really food insecure and the really the primary problem is money, when we take that money away, there are very few options. Now, you may have come up with some new strategies for eating healthier on a, on a food budget, but some of those gains are lost. And this really speaks to the need to develop more sustainable solutions in the long term, like SNAP, uh, for which people can stay enrolled in many cases until they're no longer food insecure. And we hope to have better data on that, you know, in the next six to 12 months, I would say. Hi, Hillary. Great presentation. I learned a lot. Um, just wondering, how do you integrate um, the voucher with, you know, um, present serv services or programs that folks are already on? I'm just thinking it's such an extra layer of complexity, uh, particularly for vulnerable um, you know, um, persons. And is cash a better option? Great questions. OK, so the first question is it's an additional layer of, com of complexity for people who are already enrolled in multiple programs. And the, the, this is exactly why the program is designed in the way it is, is that we really acknowledge that there is so much going on at the community level. And, and I live in San Francisco, too. So these neighborhoods already have federally qualified health centers. They already have nutrition education. They already have access to so many things. And really, when we sat there as a, as a citywide food security task force and said, what is it then that people are missing? The thing that really rose to the surface was the money. That's really what people didn't have is the money. So wherever possible, we, and this is the reason we work so closely with the, these organizations. They provide the case management. They're already working with other people in the community to provide the nutrition education. They're already supporting people to enroll in SNAP if they're eligible for SNAP. They're already doing all of these different things. But for those particular households where you've exhausted all of those and the problem is just the money, 
that's where, that's where EDSF comes in. And the other way that this enables us to be really efficient is because it would take us so much time and effort to find those people for whom the money was the, was the biggest barrier. But we're relying on our community partners to do that. So would it be better to just give people cash? I think that's a phenomenal question. And let me just give you another example because you bring it up. The earned income tax credit is also under real scrutiny federally. And we know that the earned income tax credit, which essentially just gives people income that they, that they worked for, but essentially gives people a tax refund, it works. People are less food insecure when they have access to the earned income tax credit. So yes, would it be more efficient to just give people cash? I think it would be, but we don't have the capacity as a community to, to hand out cash to people. We do have the capacity to hand out a voucher. Just following up on that, um, where is EDSF getting the, the money to reimburse the, the, the markets? Thank you for asking that. I meant to say that. It is a public-private partnership, and we really endeavor to stay 50-50 because we think it's really important that everybody has skin in the game. So the city and county of San Francisco pays for m much of the voucher, face value of the vouchers, and most of our um, operational support is from individual donors and foundations who are in really, um, uh, really focused on supporting the food system and food security in San Francisco. Most of them are local foundations, or at least California foundations. Hello. I'm curious, are there any agricultural policies that, or I guess changes in policies that you think would be really important for lowering the cost of fresh produce or whether it's local or federal? Yes, um, I am a huge believer that our, pro that our food environment um, will only be fixed uh, in the long run by policies. And many of these are probably um, agricultural policies um, in the end. What I will tell you is that it is very clear that when you lower the price of fruits and vegetables, and, and I use fruits and vegetables um, as a model for healthy food. So um, when, you, when you lower the price of healthy food, more of it gets purchased. And are there policy levers within the agricultural industry that would help subsidize the cost of healthy foods and particularly fresh fruits and vegetables? Yes, and I think from a policy perspective, those are likely to be impactful. We don't, as far as I know, have large scale studies, but we have very good studies in cafeterias, in workplace environments, in, in, um, and in other smaller settings that those subsidies do make a difference. Thank you.